Okay, Guy. All right, let's uh, call me to order or uh, what am I doing? Um, roll call. Okay, roll call. Um, Guy Mason. Present. Scott Gilbert. Present. Sarah Harkness. Here. Marie Hoda. Here. Jen Hubbard. Here. Um, Amy Wilson. Here. Um, not present, we have Austin Stryker and Council Member Cuesta. Um, staff, we have Director Christina Underhill. Here. Um, Library and Cultural Arts Manager Mark Mollis. Here. And myself, Debbie Severa. All right, thank you. I think someone else just joined too. Um... Oh, attendees. Okay, we have Council Member Cuesta joining us. Great. Uh, any questions about the minutes? Still trying to get back to them, but I don't recall having any questions. Hi, Dave. Pardon me, good evening for being late, or good evening, pardon me for being late. Hello, everyone. Hello. Okay, sorry to interrupt you, Scott. Uh, I'm, I'm still trying to get back to the minutes, but as I recall, I didn't have any questions with them from reading them. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Oh, sorry. So who, who made the motion and seconded? Oh yeah, motion. Move to approve. Second. Okay, okay thanks. <laughs> My hand disappears. <laughs> <laughs> Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, I lost my minutes. Uh, any public comment? No. Okay. Library statistical report. Okay. I'm pulling that up for you. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you. Okay. So remind me how you all like to proceed with this. It, it, um, I'm happy to walk through it. Uh, I don't know if you just have questions you wanted to ask. There, there was something I wanted to highlight about the digital materials circulation, but I'm happy to talk through whichever aspects of it you like. Yeah, I think if you highlight some things that stand out to you and then we can ask questions. Okay, sure. So um, the first thing there, just to, because it is unusual, I'll point out days of service. I, I, we, we, we listed 15. We started a curbside pickup on May 11th, and we're doing it Monday through Friday. So this statistics here re re represents the first three weeks of the curbside pickup. Um, as you can see, um, let's see. I'm trying to see what jumps out as being interesting here. Um, the physical materials circulation there, 899 items. You know, with, with the curbside pickup, what we're not having is the families that come in with their children and they walk away with 50 items. Uh, you know, people are putting holds on, they're grabbing two or three items. Um, and, and that's great, you know, but it's, it's definitely, even though we're offering curbside, we're, we're seeing a lot of traffic on that at this point. Uh, in fact, it's with the start of June, it's really, really picked up. Um, but we're not, we're probably not going to see anything even close to the kind of circulation of physical materials that we saw, um, before, you know, in, under normal circumstances. Um, so the one that I think is really interesting there is the digital materials. And if you look, that number represents, you know, 4,631 for May 2020 and 4,248 for May 2019. It seems like, you know, barely, barely nudged any growth there, right? Um, but that's why we sent along um, the supplemental statistical report. Um, Debbie, would you mind pulling that up? Should be the next document. I know um, last time we talked, you all were interested in what was going on with the you know, uh, streaming and downloads, the circulation of that stuff during the COVID closure. 
um, because you would expect that, you know, people aren't able to leave the house. They would probably be, you know, especially with, before we were even offering curbside when there was no other way to access library materials. Seems like naturally your intuition would be that people would, you know, uh, uh, be seeking out these digital materials more. But the statistics didn't seem to indicate that was what was going on. So we, we broke it out to, to explain what we're seeing here. You know, you can see Hoopla, which is um, one of our uh, downloads, the Wulumi apps that offers, you know, audiobooks and, and ebooks, that sort of thing. Um, almost doubled circulation. Canopy, the streaming movies, uh, documentaries, and independent films platform, um, had a pretty decent, you know, a decent increase year over year in plays. Uh, same thing with Zinio, which is magazines. And tumble books is really our anomaly here. Um, so the way I, sorry, let me move the video window around so I can see the numbers. So you can see, you know, tumble books went from 1700 to 72. So it's the story there. And then also why total circulation divided by four. Um, so tumble books is a um, children's books uh, application. Um, it's web-based um, and there are, there are apps as well. And what this is, is something that the library pays for alongside Englewood Public Schools. Um, and so the schools use this really heavily in the classroom. Uh, I think it's about, a, I want to say it's $2,000 a year and the library pays $500 of that. And so because we're paying for a quarter of the total cost, we, take, we statistically kind of give ourselves credit for a quarter of the total circulation. Uh, because it's available to library patrons as well as to students in schools. But of course, most of the, the usage is, uh, is coming from when the kids are in the classrooms. So that May 2019 number there, that 1700, it was actually um, four times that. It was actually between six and 7,000 um, circulations. And, and so really with the schools closed, tumble books, you know, circulation completely disappears and drags everything and it drags out the overall numbers down. Um, and so at the end of the day, you end up with these numbers, the, you know, the streaming downloads total between May 2019 and May 2020, they're both in the 4,000 range and it seems like there's hardly been any movement. But if you look at, you know, look at overdrive, you've got more than double your circulation year over year. Um, so I just thought that was kind of interesting and I thought I'd point it out to you so you could understand why those numbers look the way they look. Any questions about any of that? Uh. No, it's reassuring to see the uh, that the circulation of other digital objects, uh, you know, um, yeah, fit the fit the expected pattern with people at home. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I don't have a way to compare to what other libraries are seeing. I'd, I'd be I'd definitely be curious to hear what their experience has been. We've been trying, you know, with um. Uh, as we've done community updates via Facebook, via our website, via the newsletter. Um, to really keep hammering home the idea of we, we have these instantly available resources, we have streaming and downloads, you know, so even if you're not comfortable yet going to the library, even for the purposes of the curbside, we have something for you. Um, so we'll continue to promote that more and it's something I'm talking to the staff about now is what are best strategies for trying to continue to drive that circulation because I mean, even post pandemic, I think this stuff's really important and it's um, where a lot of library circulation is going to go in the coming years. And I want to make sure that our service offerings are as strong as they can be and also as um, it just easy to navigate. I think this, you know, there's so many different applications and it's all just a little less user friendly than, you know, the, the uh, commercial products are. Um, but I think anything we could do to just help keep that stuff simple for people is, is really great. So. That's, that's that piece of it. Um, so I guess we could return to the overall statistical report now. Um, thank you. Uh, questions answered is kind of a tricky category. You know, we, we always are, we try to count only um, uh, questions that are like reference questions. Um, so, try, so we really shouldn't be counting things like when people call or when even when the library is open, when they're in person and they're saying, Where's the bathroom? What are your hours? Those kind of questions. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm not sure what that the number last year that that, that feels high to me. So, but but we're we're watching as we do the phones now um, to try to make sure we're get, getting those uh, statistics correct um, because that stuff goes to Colorado State Library and is used um, by the state at the end of the year. Uh, going down a little bit, you can see programs. Um, we did have a few children's programs. These are virtual programs. 
Uh, we're estimating a lot of the attendance based on the video streams. Um, so as people are, are tuning in to watch the virtual programs, um, and also um, we're estimating it partly based on um, the make and takes. Um, so basically the children's team is putting together uh, take and make packages of like a, 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 a little project that the family can do, that the kids can do. And then uh, people are coming up and picking those up via curbside pickup. And um, it's, it, with, we can't perfectly capture how many people are participating in the virtual programs. Um, there's just limitations to the kind of statistics you get from Facebook. Um, and then of course, then there's the problem of one person could be just logged in and watching it, but they actually have four kids in the room. And so it's really hard for us to know. And so the take and makes have been used by the um, children's team as a way of estimating some of that attendance. Um, the uh, young adult program was also streaming. Those programs were also virtual like Zoom meetings, that sort of thing. And then we did have two uh, adult programs, including our first return to normalcy of a sort, um, an in-person in book club that took place on the, um, uh, on the plaza there where the grass is. Uh, they, they, they gathered lawn chairs, they put on masks, and they socially distanced, and they talked about a book. So that was kind of, kind of fun to see, you know, something that <laughs> resembled a normal library program, uh, just in a very unusual way. So I think that's all I made a note about in the report here. Do you really have more than 10 people for an uh, outdoor program? That no, I think, um, what's that? More, more than 10 people? Can we have more than 10 people? Or is that what, the, I'm guessing there was, right? Um, no, that adult one I think only had like three or four. So the attendance oh, between the two adult programs, one of which was virtual, uh, was a total of seven. So very, <laughs> these aren't um, huge numbers yet. Seven, yeah. Do you plan to have um, like the children's programs outside at any point, do you think? We're looking, we're, we're working with um, uh, people from the city, like Tony Arnaldi and um, we'll be talking to the health department uh, about doing some of the kids stage um, in July and hope, hopefully in July or August, we'll still be able to do some of what's been scheduled, some of those outside programs. Um, that's kind of all we're planning for at the moment. You know, we're still kind of wait. One of the upcoming updates will be about like what the state guidance has been for libraries. It's been remarkably restrictive. Um, and so Right now, that the the kids stage programs that we're kind of inquiring about when we can do those safely. That's that's all we're looking at. Okay. So that's a good question, though. All right, great. What's next here? The uh, physical report supplemental library action plan. Yeah, so we've been trying to be, you know, I'm sure you've all observed we're a lot more active on Facebook than we were before. Uh, I feel like every time I open Facebook now, Kimberly is there. Um, and it's great. Um, we're, we're trying to be strategic about not overwhelming the community with, or, you know, anyone who's following us on Facebook with just endless, you know, endless children stuff or endless, en endless of anything that's too much the same. Um, and so we we're, we put together a staff team to kind of come up with some of the strategies for, you know, we're thinking about how we approach Facebook, how we approach Goodreads and a couple other platforms that may be of value. Um, and then our website, of course, is essential to all of this. Um, right now, uh, the library has, since, since I've been aware of Englewood Library, always used englewood.marmot.org as its primary URL, which is actually the library catalog. So if you get a library card, What's printed on there is angwood.marmot.org. So not not the website that has information about events, not the website that has information about like where the library is and what's going on at the library, um, or, or that has you know information about how to use the da the downloadable resources. It's just the catalog, um, and so that's something we'd like to rethink. At some point, it would be nice to have. Uh, we know we how do I put this? We know the number one reason that most people visit a library's website 
is to use the catalog search. And so it makes sense that that's your, if that's your primary activity, that's why we've always advertised that as the URL. But of course, most libraries' websites, what, what you do is you go and you visit, and they have catalog search right there, and it's usually just a search widget, um, where if you start searching for something, it bumps you away from the actual website over to the catalog page. Um, but while you make the visit there to that front page, what you see is what's, what are the upcoming events, what, or what is the key pieces of information the library wants to tell you about. And so that's a real opportunity every time you get a web visitor to, to just remind them about the things going on at the library. So we'd like to design a website that works that way. Um, but the problem is our, our current we're currently limited. We can't even have a search widget on our website. Um, so we, a couple of us staff and I have joined the website committee for the city. They look at doing things like uh, creating an events microsite and doing um, a, web, a website redesign for the city, which is gonna be discussed in the future. Um, it's not 100% that they're gonna do that yet, um, but we wanna be part of that conversation to make sure that whatever direction uh, we end up going as the, as the city's website evolves, that it actually meets the needs. So, so I'd ramble about that, but I thought that's kind of important. Yeah, as we talk about virtual team programming continues um, and you know, we're getting good engagement with that. Um, curbside services, uh, like I said, it's, it's just, it's picking up steam as it goes on. When we started out, we were looking at about 50% of our available appointments were being uh, filled. And the last week or so, it's been much closer to 100%. Um, and that's good. That means, you know, people are using it. Um, we're, we're looking at whether we can expand our capacity or, or how that's going to work. Um, just because it helps us to maintain circulation. And that's obviously the goal of increasing use of the library facility and collections year to date. It's, it seems like it's out the window at this point um, just because of the closure, but we're gonna do everything we can to keep the numbers as high as possible. Um, as far as curbside, I have two questions. Yeah, please. One, when making holds on Marmot, mm -hmm. I'm feeling it, this might be incorrect, but it feels like when I make a hold, it'll say like, hey, this is available. And then it seems like it's available from our library and then it's not. And I'm just wondering, one, is anything happening with like the interlibrary thing with Marmot in general yet? And also, is there a way when you're to maybe streamline if you are just getting books from our library now? Yeah. Is there a way to just search our catalog because um, yeah yeah there's so at the start of uh right before we started curbside um yeah. one thing if you go to the marmot the angle.marmot.org the catalog site uh one of the top items under browse the catalog is a button that says available now mm -hmm. um, that is set up so that you it's basically a filter that the items have to be available at anglewood now at Englewood. Uh, okay yeah, availability with these catalogs gets really tricky because yeah. at default, if you say available now, um, that, that will sometimes catch different, for example, if the single bibliographic record has multiple formats in it, mm -hmm. um, it might say, oh, it's available now because you know the, this other format is available or it's available now because it's available now at another library. And so we're, that, that one should, um, drill down so that you're just seeing stuff that's available at Englewood at the, you know, ready to go Good. in the right format. Okay. Um, cool. but, but that's, yeah, that, that one's tricky. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to test it out of my iPad right next to the screen yeah, here yeah, to make yeah. sure it's working the way I think it is. It's of course being completely unhelpful and unresponsive. I can't even get the button to work. Um, I just imagine that might be frustrating for other patrons as well. Like when they're like, Oh, I think I'm placing a hold and then it, nothing ever comes through with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Thinking of so, my three-year-old, especially wanting. To. Oh, abs no, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, if it's if it's available at Englewood, you know, if you look in the catalog, and it says it, it should say which location the item is at. Okay. Um, then we are able to grab it and you know fulfill that hold. If it's available Perfect. at another library, there's no courier service between the libraries right now. No, not yet. Um, okay. And so that hold is just going to kind of get stuck in in limbo. And so a lot of and it, it this whole system has been built. Um, 
the consortial lending model for Marmot um, with the idea that you know you can transfer items between libraries easily enough. And so there's been a lot of things in the back end that have gotten really um, confused and kind of yeah, it, it, it's challenging. Like so, for example, if uh, if you place a hold on something that is at Englewood Library, but somebody else has also placed a hold on it and they are off in Mesa County or something and they they place the hold first, then we have to know to go through and um, basically not fulfill their hold, but find a way to bump you up to the top of the list so that you get it rather than that other person. So we've been, we're having to work through a lot of like weird kinks yeah. that have just, that just come along with never having had this limitation before, so. Cool, thanks. So is the courier service shut down for lack of business or because of uh, like uh, virus guidelines? Um, well, with most, the, so the courier service is actually a, uh, it's, it's, the courier system is run by Click, which is the Colorado Library Consortium, but they contract that out to a private courier service. Um, known as what it's called they're called western states they they are they're not shut down for any reason in fact they were during the peak of covid doing a ton of business because they do a lot of like um, deliveries to like medical centers and hospitals and places like that it's the same courier service that we use um, but um, as only you know as libraries start to come back online uh, or come back you know to, to reopening in various phases, whether it's curbside or in some places, the counties are received variances, whether it's in person, um, we're able to make a request through Click, the, the, the consortium that manages the courier service for libraries in Colorado, um, and say, we're ready to go. We're ready to receive items again. We're ready to have courier deliveries, you know, come and take stuff and take stuff off our hands. Um, but then Click is making the decision based on their contract with Western States because what for from Western States perspective, they want to get paid, right? So they want to make sure that they're not just like talking, you know, running items between Englewood and then driving it all the way out to uh, the Western Slope, right? Like they need to be able to hit the stops along the way for that to make sense for, for them. And so it's as, as various libraries kind of volunteer like, hey, we're ready to go again. Uh, Click is saying, okay, let's bring this courier route back online. Let's bring this courier route back online. Um, and so far, it seems like nothing in the metro area has come back online. I think that's because all, all the big neighboring libraries are still, you know, um, in, a, in a holding pattern. Um, so we have put in our request. We're, we're, we told them we're ready to go. And we're just waiting to get the, you know, to get the announcement that we'll, we'll be receiving courier service again. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh yeah, so um, under the awareness local history, I just thought it was fun. I don't know if you all saw the video put together by the communications department um, for the history, the 100 year history of the Englewood Library. Did anybody catch that one? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. Yeah. So. <laughs> Hey, so, you know, the, uh, I remember when my kids used to go to the bookmobile and then they grew up and so I didn't notice that it wasn't there anymore. When did that stop? I don't know. I was wondering the same thing. Um, I'll have to figure that out. It's a great question. I was just curious. You know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of like the way I lost track of diaper prices for, you know, 30 years, right? Right. I keep, I keep thinking that, like, I'm going to find, like, a tarp, like, around in the garage somewhere and pull the tarp off and give <laughs> me the road runner, you know? Like. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Good uh, action plan. Um, so we can move on to new business. Uh, you're going to talk about the current available services. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I'm, so I think you're all aware that we're doing curbside pickup now um, for library holds. We've also started offering um, pickup for um, print jobs. If people, so there's a remote printing website that you could uh, log on to you, from your home. You could send a print job to our printers at the library, and we're printing out 25 pages, black and white, or 10 pages of color. Uh, per user for free during this. 
Um, so we've had, you know, a few people take us up on that. Um, and like I said, the, the volume of demand has been pretty good. Um, we're, it's, it's staff intensive to do curbside uh, because it's just so much running things out there. We're taking such precautions about disinfecting everything, holding items in quarantine. Um, so it's, it's more staff intensive than normal circulation, but that's, that's where our focus has been. I've been putting together planning for the next phase of reopening. And um, actually we've drawn up a fairly detailed plan for allowing people back in to use the computers on an appointment basis. Um, uh, but what happened was the state on about May, I wanna say May 26th or May 27th, put, to, put out an order, um, uh, an, an amendment to the Safer at Home executive order um, that limited the libraries to uh, curbside pickup, drive-through services, you know, walk-up windows, that sort of thing. Basically anything, you can circulate physical materials, but you can't allow people into the facility. Um, and so when the Safer at Home order was extended through July 1st, um, Colorado State Library um, let us let, you know, let all the library um, managers, managers and directors know. So that means unless you have received a variance, your county has received a variance and libraries are specifically called out as something that can come back into you know, normal operations to, that, they, that we're limited to curbside or to walk up or that sort of thing. Um, and so right now that's where we're at. We're, we're on hold until July 1st. Um, we're obviously planning for what the next phase of reopening is gonna be. Um, and we're certainly thinking about um, these sort of competing needs. You know, we know, we know the community really needs the library. Um, it's certainly weighing on me pretty heavily right now that there's a lot of people out there who uh, need access to computers, need access to the internet, don't have that at home. Um, and it's a major resource uh, in their lives. And uh, they're probably people who are being hit harder by the current state of the economy than, than most others. Um, and then, but we also know that when we reopen, we have to be really cautious about staff safety um, and the safety of our users. Um, you know, a lot of the library users are, are belong to vulnerable populations. Um, so we're, there's a lot of plan, you know, a lot of details that go into trying to make sure we can reopen safely. Um, that's all to say that when we reopen, we don't exactly know what the, it's not going to look like we just throw the doors open and business as usual, especially if July 1st comes and none of the other big neighboring libraries have reopened. Um, we haven't heard a peep out of Denver as to what their plans are. And um, D Arapaho and Jeffco libraries both came online with, um, curbside pickup a lot, lot later than we did. Um, and so I don't, I don't anticipate at this point that July 1st is gonna arrive and they're gonna be opening their doors. Um, so if we do, and, and we would like to, uh, we'll probably need to do things like put a cap on the number of people who come into the library at any given time. Um, because otherwise, if, if we're the only library that's open in the metro area, um, we don't know what the volume of traffic is going to look like, and th then you risk the um, uh, then th that that would probably be uh, inconsistent with whatever guidance we get from the health department in terms of our capacity. Um, I know most places that have reopened have been told to monitor the number of people coming in coming in the door. Um, so we're the plans are evolving as the state guidance evolves and as we kind of watch what other libraries are doing. Very good. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I wasn't laughing because anything's funny. It's just because the world is so topsy turvy. You know? <laughs> it really is. And, and like, I was um, talking to the uh, manager of the recreation center for Englewood, um, Allison Boyd, and she was. We were just laughing about how strange it is that they're able to reopen and the library is not. Like, is it? <laughs> it's just very. It feels inconsistent in a way, but. We, yeah. we do what we do. Do you think it's mainly because of like the homeless population or is it just, you don't know why? Or the... I'm, I, I'm speculating and I'm actually, this kind of secondhand speculation because that question was presented to some of the commissioners for Colorado State Library. And they felt that what it actually reflects is um, 
that uh, this is they're very similar to guidance that's been received for uh, educational uh, institutions. Um, and so like, uh, I think the Colorado Department of Education and the Colorado State Library share a building. And I think from the state government's perspective, it's kind of like, okay, what are we doing with all the educational stuff? Okay, we're telling them just don't let people in the, in the facilities for now. Okay, libraries fall under that. And so they're not really thinking, you know, so it's just that's the metaphor that they're operating with rather than, you know, thinking about libraries as their own thing. All right. So I, like, we have a um, new t business topic today uh, for the public libraries and homeschooling. Uh, thank you for submitting that. Um, is that Sarah? I think? Yeah. This is something I know we've talked a little bit about before in the past. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about schools next year, and I thought it would be a good time to bring it up more formally. Um, and this article, I wanted to share this article mainly because it shows what libraries have already been doing. Unfortunately, a lot of libraries in the Denver area are not um, targeting homeschoolers. And I think there's a huge opportunity for the Inglewood Library to pick up some of that slack. And um, there's a huge um, homeschool population in the Denver Metro, and we're so centrally located. We already have a lot of the resources um, that homeschoolers are looking for. I think it's just a matter of reaching out to them and um, starting that relationship because I think we could have a lot more patrons, a lot more programs. Um, the teen programs, a lot of the kids who go to those are from the homeschool community and it's pretty easy to network within that community. I shared um, a link to one of those teen programs on Facebook and a bunch of kids from the group I shared it in ended up coming and they, they've come back over and over again. So I just think it, there's a huge opportunity there that's not being met. What is, what, was, um, go ahead, please. What is, what is the network like? Is it, is it mostly like social media or are there um, like, like uh, dedicated websites where people trade things? Well, there's, um, there's a lot of people are on Facebook. So sharing things on the library Facebook page would really help to spread the word because that I know that there's a lot of homeschoolers in who live in Inglewood who look at the Inglewood library website who would share that with their groups and network that way. Um, another option is the parks, the recreation center has had a homeschool swim lesson that's been going on for at least since my oldest was little. I know that there was a mom in it who went to it when she was a kid. So it's been oh, wow. going on for a really long time and it's very popular. So I think there's an opportunity to partner with the, um, I think it's Kay Wallace at the rec center who runs that to get some names. Um, when we went to it, most of the people who were attending lived either in Inglewood or just right outside of Inglewood. I think there's a lot of opportunities to reach out though. Yeah, that, that seems really smart. Um, I, I was gonna say, I apologize, Kimberly is not here because I, I did, after uh, we, you sent that along, I, I had a conversation with her about this and, and she had a lot to say. And in, in a positive way, she's, she's also really interested in it. You know, her perspective was that, you know, we, we, we know that we have a lot of our uh, regular attendees of story times and programs and that sort of thing, our families uh, with a, at home school, and um, that we already have a relationship with a lot of these families, but that there's probably opportunity to do more to provide uh, specific services. Um, and so there, there where she expressed a little bit of ambivalence was just around the balance of does it make sense to to offer a program that's specific to uh, to families at home school or does it make more sense to offer a program that's you know applicable to, to everybody and then of course that the the families at home school benefit as well um so i'd be curious to know like are there specific things that you think would be better targeted to those kind of to those families specifically yeah. Um, I was trying to think of things that the library already does that homeschoolers may just not know about. And one uh -huh. of the big things that people are interested, they want free meeting space for co-ops. And that's okay. something you guys already offer. I think they just don't know about it and reaching out 
specifically like, hey, homeschoolers, did you know that we offer free meeting space? And it's it would be during the weekday. I have a right. feeling that might not be a super busy time. I don't really know. But I think no, just... We, yeah, we usually have rooms available. Um, they are, we, I, don't, I know we charge for the meeting rooms. Um, and I don't know oh, if we yeah. have an exemption for um, any, any reasons. I'd have to review the policies. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, it hasn't come up while we've been closed. I'm not up to speed on where the, what those policies are. Um, but a but, but free meeting space would be really valuable for families at homeschool. I yeah. think we, yeah. we actually um, decided to increase or add the charges for the meeting rooms at some point in the past. Okay. Yeah. Not that long ago, if I remember. Mm -hmm. Remember that, right, Scott, or anyone else? Yeah, I remember that. Um, you know, I would think that for, for something as altruistic as homeschooling, which is often families who are already making really significant financial sacrifices to homeschool, um, I, if the policy doesn't allow it, I would certainly support changing that policy. Um, I mean, we, we homeschooled for a while and uh, it, it takes time. I mean, it, and it's like you're not earning money during that, that time, you know. It, it was a, a, a financially burdensome thing to do. Mm -hmm. and, and I was always looking for free things to do. And, and, and I would think the homeschool community is definitely a group that you want to get in the groove of using the library um, because they'll, they'll be lifetime users, you know. Um, their kids learn to teach themselves and the library is fabulous for that. Um, you know, I, I don't, um, I mean, what I know about Facebook is don't talk politics. <laughs> Put pictures of my grandchildren up, right? But if, like on Facebook, if the library were to um, like these homeschool group pages, would the library's post then start showing up for those groups? Would, would they be more likely to see library events in that? I think it's the other way around. The group would have mm -hmm. to like the faith, the library, and then they will start to see, if they, if they choose to, they'll start to see that content. Um, if we were to go out, if we were to reach out and like, you know, and, and add them and to our network, we would see what they're doing, which is also valuable, but right. yeah. Maybe we can add some kind of goal to the, or something to the action plan about just publicizing the library resources that are available to the homeschool community, something like that. Does that sound? And another thing, people are interested in curriculum and I was looking through your catalog and there's actually a lot there, which surprised <laughs> me. And I, I have been homeschooling off and on and I was surprised at what you have. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I wish I would have, I wish I would have <laughs> checked there for that before I bought it. So, so, so kind of what I'm hearing then is that it's a lot of it is a um, more, it's more of a marketing problem than anything yeah. else. It's about making, increasing the awareness of what we offer rather than inventing new services or, and if you think of, please, if you think of programs, if you think of materials, anything like that, that, that would benefit this community, I, I think we'd be very interested. Um, but, but, it, but what I'm hearing is that it, we really should be focusing on promoting this stuff more. Yeah, I think it would just be, a, that would be a great first step, just especially now when you can't meet in person, just to put your arm out and reach out to them. Be like, hey, we're here for you. We have so many resources. Right. And then and naturally, in conversation as we build those alliances, we'll, 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 we'll hear feedback about what we're missing or what we could be doing. So, yeah. Exactly. That's is great. there a way in the, in the catalog, is there a way to add a category of curriculum? To, to show what um, items in the catalog would be useful for curriculum? That's a really good question. I believe there's a way to do um, some sort of custom lists, but yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly how that works, but it's certainly something that we could look into because that, that would be really valuable. I mean, I could, I could see having like on the library website, a, a sort of a landing page for homeschool material, you know, for homeschool resources right. generally. And then you could list link out to the catalog where it populates that list of stuff that's specific. So that's a, that's also a really good idea. Forget the term. Isn't there a term for a guide on how to do, how to do certain things in the library? So, um, is it like a, resource guide for a topic yeah <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure what the precise term of art is in, in, uh, 
for this one. It's a library word. But yeah. I, I know exactly what you're, I, I know what you're talking about. I just, I've never built one, so I'm not sure, I can't remember now. I know what you're talking about though. <laughs> I can't think what it's called. Okay, well that sounds good. Um, when I move on to, do we have to? Um, I, I actually had a new business item that I didn't submit that I'd like to talk about if that's okay. All right. <laughs> Is that all right? I guess so. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that I appreciated the library's social media post about being inclusive, but I wanted to know what kind of action items there are as far as I don't know, advertising anti-racist materials, um, bringing inclusive, inclusivity and diversity into like children's programming, just making it more visible um, for everyone, patrons. I, because I, we've been in such a weird spot with COVID, yeah. I don't, it has not really, I mean, okay. I, I don't, that's a great question and I feel embarrassed to be ill-prepared to answer it. Um, I, you know, I could talk through what our values are and where we would like to go, but I'd actually rather turn it around on, you know, and ask what you would like to yeah. see. What, what, would, what do you think would be the, you know? Well, yeah. immediately thoughts that I have are that um, Hoopla in particular, I know has a ton of anti-racist books that are just there that I think that um, you might receive some flack from more conservative people on Facebook, but I think that it would just be the right message to send that like, hey, all of these books are available right now as audiobooks, ebooks, whatever. A great idea. Um, I think that calling some collections of diverse books for children would be really beneficial. I think that nudging um, the children's librarians who are, I guess it's Kimberly now, but bringing more diversity into the books that they're sharing. I know they do a lot of animals, but I think, I just think that visibility is really important. And yeah, yeah. Something that we're not perhaps focused on specifically enough. I yeah. think, I think with libraries, it's easy for us to just take for granted, like, oh, of course, inclusivity is one of our values. Right. And we're all, of, of course, we're all about these things, but, but you're yeah. right. There's specific actions that I think can have value. Yeah. Um, especially with um i think the mayor said she was hoping to do a book club um yep. getting your hands on more copies of that book and having that available would be great i yeah and i emailed the mayor about the the idea that they she wants to do a book club i think the library would really like to support her on that um and she emailed me back during the course of this meeting so i haven't had a chance to okay. uh, interview <laughs> that but the, yeah we'll be following up on that for sure um so I'm hearing um, promotion of library materials that are, um, you know, specifically like anti-racist materials that are available um, on Hoopla. You mentioned um, I, I, I love that because it's that mm -hmm. stuff is instantly accessible to people. Yeah. Um, and then uh, trying to improve the d diversity in the story time materials, um, yeah. and just putting a focus on that for. Um, any sort of upcoming programs, that sort of thing. I know that, um, yeah, I, I know it's something that, you know, just the conversations I'm having with staff, this is coming up every single day. So yeah. it would very much make sense for us to-, to I to, mean, I'll, yeah. I'm gonna show up my children, my child's artwork right now, which is this, this is one of the Taken makes. This is her grandma. Uh -huh. I was really, I was nervous opening the thing like, Oh no, it's just gonna be white skin. My kids are Asian. My daughter is the picture. Interesting. On, my daughter is the picture. Who's the Facebook profile? Yeah, picture. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but Kimberly, the team had included five different skin colors, so I was okay. like really pleased by that. That's good. And that was just yeah. that's just a little thing, and I was able it, to like have my daughter go to the mirror and say like, which one do you think looks like you? Wow. Um, it's a little thing, just, except that it's actually a it's, huge thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that the library needs to support the community in that way. Okay. Cool. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have some old business to cover. The 100th birthday update. I guess the minute of the video, right? 
Yeah, uh, so we did the, you, you saw the 100th birthday video that was um, done by the communications team. Uh, we, there was also the happy birthday video I know some of you submitted uh, to, um, and that was that went up on social media as well. Uh, we, I think we all had a lot of fun with that one. Um, and then uh, we uh, uh, were uh, lucky, uh, fortunate enough to get a proclamation uh, read and approved by the city council uh, at the most recent city council meeting. Um, and we, uh, let's see, I don't know if you, if you, we pulled aside the fancy special edition book bags. Have any of you received your special edition book bags yet? If not, awesome. we've got some, okay, we've got some pulled aside for you. They're the same <laughs> as our, um, the, the white book bags with the library, the, the library card art by, by Jolt, I believe was the name of the artist. It's that, except it's a black and it has a logo on, uh, a little hundred, hundred year uh, logo on it. So. We gave those away with um, curbside pickup. Uh, the, I guess it was last week now. Uh, we had 100. We thought, well, great, we'll have enough to get through the whole week, and they were gone in like two days. So, yeah, we, we flew through those. Um, let's see. We've got – we're still trying to figure out what the programming is going to look like for the remainder of the summer. You know, we want to do the um, preservation about the history of the library, um, and that one we're, we're – considering moving it virtual but we're just kind of waiting to see what the evolution the next evolution of the safer at home guidance is to see if we're able to do in-person programming um same thing for the silent movie uh silent movie night and then same thing for the gala we're just uh we're, we're just kind of watching to see what the guidance is um that's that's the update uh, next phases of reopening I guess we kind of talked through that one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And the summer reading program. Oh, yeah, summer reading program. Let me pull that up. Uh, Kimberly sent me some numbers. I thought you'd all be interested. Um, so, right so far, we, you know, everything is virtual or everything's digital. Um, we've had 344 kids sign up for the reading program so far. Uh, we can really notice that we generally get about, get about 850 by the end of the summer. Um, so she feels pretty good about those numbers being three weeks in um, and it being such unusual circumstances. Um, she, says about, she says about 35% of the kids signed up for summer reading are from Englewood schools. Um, and they're, like I said before, they're basing the attendance uh, for programs on the number of take and makes. She says the first two weeks we gave out 50 take and makes and they're on track to hand out the same number this week. Um, and she mentions that she says we've had so many families express gratitude for everything we are doing. The kids are loving the crafts, and it's giving them something to do. Um, and I, 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 she is really understating the case on that one. We've had parents come in just in, in tears because, like, their kid. It's just it's just such a relief to have something resembling normalcy. Um, and then we know how valuable summer reading can be for families. Um, so. Uh, Kimberly has been really doing wonderful work to support the families um, who are, you know, trying to figure out how they can give their kids a normal summer and how summer reading can be part of that. Um, she says, we've had eight teams of the teen program last week, seven of the book club meeting yesterday. Um, and then if everyone who picked up a kit comes tonight, we'll have 10 to 12. So they feel pretty good about where the teen attendance is at. Then tweens have been hit and miss, but we've had several pickup take and makes for this week, so they're expecting seven to ten. So, not not is the kind of numbers we'd like to see on a normal year, but you know, given the circumstances, especially the you know 350 or so kids who've signed up for some reading so far, that that feels good. Great. Do you have anything for staff's choice? I've been talking so much, Christina. <laughs> 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 yeah, let me, um, I'll just share more general city information from the Park Shark Library site so you just kind of know where the city's at. There has been, um, the Inglewood Recreation Center is going to open with limited hours. They'll be open Monday through Thursday from 6 um, a.m. to 1 p.m. And then um, they'll reopen, they'll clean the center from 1 to 4 and then reopen at 4 o'clock um, and run until 9 p.m. And then on Fridays, they're open from 9 to 1 and then 4 to 8. And then Saturday and Sunday, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. 
And then Mali um, is going to reopen um, with limited access to programming. Um, and you do have to make an appointment actually at both locations uh, to uh, visit. Um, we're trying to keep crowds down and, and not overwhelm the centers. As far as parks are concerned, trails, restrooms, our dog park, Canine Corral, uh, playgrounds and the skate park is back open. Um, the pavilions are not available for, for rentals yet. Uh, people are using them, but we're not renting them for a fee at this point. So it's first come, first serve. Uh, and then to pickleball and tennis, they're open for drop and play. So we're starting to slowly reopen. I'm sure you're wondering about uh, Pirates Cove and Farm and Train. Those are both tentative. Um, I don't know for sure if they are going to reopen this summer. Uh, we look at revenue and expenditures uh, for both those amenities and um, it's, it's costly to run a water park over the summer and if we can't make our revenue and it's at a loss, uh, we may not be able to reopen, but we are taking that information to city council on Wednesday night. We're having a special meeting Wednesday night um, for a handful of things, not just for that, uh, but it'll be kind of towards the end of the meeting during the COVID update that we'll present that to council. So um, that's where we're at with reopening as far as parks, rec and libraries. The golf course is, is wide open and, and packed if you're a golfer. Um, so that's good. We're always looking at revenue and making sure we can keep keep afloat during these times. So um, that's all I've got. It's good seeing everybody. Just curious, and with uh, Water World closed, or is there concern that Pirates Cove will be totally overrun? That's that's the fear, and the current, and this is it, this kind of goes back to the library too, as far as crowd control um, and how many people you're allowed to have in a facility. And right now, they were saying uh, twenty five percent or um, fifty people, whichever's fewer, into a facility. So. Um, it's kind of odd that library doesn't fall into that category. They're specifically called out separately to stay closed for now. Uh, but yet they're giving these types of regulations to recreation centers, to the water, um, outdoor aquatic pools, things like that. So um, yeah, we're, we're worried. I'm worried for the staff having to deal with large crowds showing up that don't quite read the website or the Facebook or how we advertise understand it's going to be very limited service um, for when we do open if we do so that's going to be a challenge I think I think Pirates Cove averaged like 1600 people a day and right now the most we can see in a day with time slots and everything and we're trying to figure out how to open it's 450 people and that's it that's as many that we can let into the water park so um, yeah there's going to be some challenges uh, with that but yeah that's our that's our biggest fear is with water world being closed and many other outdoor pools um, in the Denver, Denver metro area not opening will potentially get overrun is your summer staffing made up um, like of a lot of young people typically yeah and you know we think about that too for for some of like our lifeguards the concessions specifically at the water park and at farm and train there are a lot of high school students and this might be their first job. And unfortunately, if, if we don't open, they don't get that opportunity to have their first job. So we understand it's a ripple effect um, by not opening something, but we also have to be very cognizant of, of the cost to a city and the financial status of the city. And our city in Inglewood, we're doing really well. We're doing okay during this, where many other cities are furloughing, laying off people, canceling major programs. Um, and events. I know we canceled 4th of July, but that was multi-jurisdictional. Um, and I, I don't know how you crowd control for an event that large with social distancing. You just right. really can't. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's just a lot of challenges. And we I think about that employment. These kids might be really excited to have their first job or come back and get a little bit of money um, for the summer that'll carry them through the rest of the school year, yeah. uh, that we won't have that opportunity to give them. So. You know, actually, I wasn't thinking that so much is that it's it might be a really angry summer to have high school kids in public facing situations. It's it's a touchy time. People are loaded for bear. Um, if, if I had a high school kid working, I don't think I'd want them dealing with the public and telling them they couldn't come in someplace or had to wear a mask or or had to stay distant, you know. I, I don't know, it just occurred to me. Yeah, that's a challenge. And even at the library, I know that's that can be a challenge too. People want in and they don't understand why the doors are still closed. You know, everybody go about your business. And 
there's a fear. We have to think about our community. We have to think about the health of our community. And I know none of us want to make the headline of, you know, COVID outbreak at the Inglewood Library. <laughs> that does not need to hit the front page of the paper ever. And same thing with Mali, the you know, Pirates Cove, it were open, the rec center. We are so cautious on how we're doing this to protect our residents, to protect our staff and keep everybody as healthy as possible. Because we want everybody to keep coming back year after year. We don't want to lose anybody. So yeah, we've, this is a challenging time across the board, whether you're working for a city government or you, you know, you're homeschooling your kids or whatever, this has just been a trying time for everybody and, and patience is where we're at. <laughs> and just understanding and listening to others and taking concerns into account. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's glad I don't have to deal with the public. So <laughs> good for you for doing that. Um, what do we, so, okay, board member's choice, I guess. Uh, I've, I've been reading some kind of book on my Kindle that appeared. I don't even know what it's called and where it came from. It just, it just showed up. So it's about Japan or something. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was called Kyoki, but that, that doesn't seem to exist. So I don't know what it is. Um, and I think I'm going to be spending the next while cleaning up my uh, yard from the, all the branches that seem to keep appearing. I think that my neighbors are just giving me more branches because they seem to just be more that show up. Um, so yeah. Uh, who's next? Amy? Oh, sure. Mm, yes, I too have been picking up branches. And it is a billing because it happens every day. And my garden is looking very good. And I've read a million books this month. So <laughs> it's a good summer so far, other than the picking up the branches. <laughs> uh, Jen, how are you? And how's the, uh, how is the school looking? Um, I'm doing well. Schools are, if you haven't heard, are a little rough because of the budget cuts that are coming down. Um, we will have the public hearing and, and the final decision of, on the budget, or at least we hope we'll have a final decision on the budget on the 23rd of this month. Um, by law, it has to happen no later than June 30th, where we pass a, a budget for the next school year. Problem is that we don't have any numbers from the state, so we don't know how much we have to cut. And so it's hard to make decisions when you don't know how how far you have to go um but uh, that's going to be that's going to be brutal uh to be honest and so if you guys are interested or what have you um make sure you tune in to the to the meeting on the 23rd because that's where as long as we have numbers from the state that's where we'll be making decisions and, and what stays and what goes all right scott <laughs> Well, I've been throwing branches in your yard, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, besides that, um, just trying to get into the groove of this weird life of being home most of the time. My wife and I go out and, you know, drive out to a place out in the country and watch a sunset most nights and just try not to uh, get caught up in the craziness of everything that's going on. And, and uh, beyond that, working and trying not to look too far in the future because it's scary out there. That's about it. Sarah? Um, I've just been trying to stay sane. I can relate to um, the parents who come into the library and thank you guys for trying to keep things normal. Um, my kids, that's the hardest part of this. My kids are going crazy, which means I'm going crazy too. Maybe crazier than I normally would. But just <laughs> <laughs> just thank you all for, I mean, I, I'm a stay at home mom and I think this whole thing is hard and crazy, but for all you trying to run departments and work on budgets and trying to hold all the, the fabric of society <laughs> together in many ways, just thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I just want to say, so I, like when I started, like for the first like month and a half of the pandemic closure, you know, I wasn't working. And so I had been for the pro couple years prior to that, I'd been a stay at home parent as well. And um, I, I, I can tell you the stay at home parenting job, way harder, way harder <laughs> than you know, the rest of it. So good, yeah, good for you and hang in there. Thanks. Three. Um, yeah, 
we're enjoying the take and make activities too, as I showed. Um, I was telling one of my friends or my mom or something that it's like, it's like those like books, boxes that you can subscribe to and get a box for your kids for once a month. But like we get it every week and it's for free. So thank you. <laughs> um, and yeah, I just finished listening like right before this meeting to Stamped from the Beginning, which is one of the audiobooks that's available on Hoopla by Ibram X. Kendi. And it was just, it's 400 years of racist history in America. And it was very enlightening and I would recommend it to everyone it's right there it's like it's like listening to a textbook but it's it's great and terrible that was called stamped by history stamped, stamped from, from the beginning stamped from the beginning okay sorry yeah. a definitive history of racism in America or something like that and Dave Yes, um, I guess th things immediately um, relevant to our group here. We did have our board interviews last night, board and commission interviews. We had three great candidates for um, library board. I think that uh, we had enough folks to fill other vacancies on other boards and commissions too that we'll pick up all three. So I'm really excited, um, fresh blood for the group and uh, people that were really enthusiastic about the library board. Uh, so I'm really excited how that worked out. Um, in terms of reading, my daughter and I are working our way through sideways stories at a wayside school, which I read many years ago as a child, and she seems to really be enjoying it too. I don't know how that hasn't been made a movie. I keep thinking that after several chapters, or, or maybe it hasn't, and I just haven't uh, realized it. And uh, it, it just, I, I've been doing, doing some uh, branch cleanup too. I always say I'll take free water. You know, we got some rain again this morning in my lawn. I, I didn't get to it this weekend. It's growing out of control, which is a good problem to have. But uh, it, it's starting to feel like summer a bit. I'm, I really appreciate, excuse me, that's my dog in the background. I really appreciate the work from parks. Um, I live right down the street from Bellevue Park. We were there yesterday and lots of people in the streams hanging out, you know, and, and people, you know, it looks normal over there, which I'll, I'll take any little slices of normal I can get. So it's, it's, it's nice to get back there. I know that caution and, and, you know, not thinking we're through this is critical, but uh, anytime I can get a little piece of what, what it feels like last summer was, I'll take it. Um, so, so thanks to park staff and, and uh, thanks to the group here, but we should hopefully have three new members. That I think are going to be really solid. Thanks guys. All right, great. Thank you. All right. If there's anything else from anybody, I guess we can adjourn. Good Thank seeing y'all. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye, Thank you.